All right, welcome along to the Team 33 Christmas special. Now, this is not going to be very Christmassy, might not even be particularly special, but we're going to be doing something on books. I'm Raf Giallo. You can get us on Twitter, at Team 33, also on Facebook and also on iTunes. And a couple of people from the regular members of the show who've never really done their TV debuts, Joe Coffey, welcome Raph, along. We did a Skype session once. We did, uh, which worked out very nicely. Well, I was very enthusiastic about uh, what Arsenal were going to do for the coming season. Yeah, with Eno Emery and uh, Keen Roach, welcome along. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, as you can see, I've brought in books, and uh, I think we had all agreed to, but uh, they're quite heavy to bring in, so we're <laughs> probably not going to do that. And anyway, later on the, later on the show as well, um, obviously we're recording this on the day Jose Mourinho uh, got the sack from Manchester United, so we'll be discussing that and other issues as well. But, books-wise, what have you been reading this year that's, uh, that's actually come out, maybe football-wise first? Yeah, well, I suppose I have, um, I have a few suggestions. Um, I think... The one that uh, most people t seem to be talking about as a stocking filler or as the best football book of the year would be um, uh, Peter Crouch's book, uh, The How to Be a Footballer. Um, so basically that is, I suppose it's a little bit different from the, the usual, um, it's a, a little bit different from the usual in that like it's not just like an autobiography about Peter Crouch, a lot of it is swapping stories, all the anecdotes. I mean. To be honest, when it comes to autobiographies for sport, they tend to be ones that are looking at um, what, like what, what you take out of it. What works best is it's it's the anecdotes. I mean, that's what people want. Yeah. Uh, that's the, like when when people ask you, oh, what was you know whatever book you, you read, what was good, and uh, it's usually one with the talk about oh well they said this and this. I mean, like, even if we look at some of the autobiographies, the, the most famous ones, like the Keen one, the Keen 2, should I say, yeah, uh, I you, you, te you, tend to, you tend to basically talk about the anecdotes he has, what he said to him, etc., etc. So his one, I mean, like, because this is a... Um, because the, the, the book basically is about funny things that have... Like, he's, he's quite a self... Uh, deprecating type deprecating person. I mean, he has yeah. that famous quote, doesn't he? Uh, from <laughs> <laughs> he uh, somebody asked him, "What would he be if he wasn't a football, a professional footballer?" And he said, "A virgin." <laughs> <laughs> Just about as honest as you can get. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, by all accounts, a very nice, a very nice person. Um, I won't go into the anecdotes. I mean, to be honest, the only issue with it is the fact that some of the best ones were heavily serialized when he was talking about, even when he was doing his interviews about the book. He'd, I mean, I think most people who had any kind of passing interest in what was going on in soccer would probably have come across his yeah. uh, his one about uh, him being in the flash sports car and Roy Keane pulling up beside him. So uh, I would think that... I would think that uh, if if you can, it's one more so. Not like it's just it's just an enjoyable read. If you're looking for something yeah. that yeah. it's kind of, I won't say leave your brain at the door, but certainly you won't have to think too it, it, it deeply about you. Just it's just enjoyable, just funny crack, stories. Yeah. yeah, bit of crack, and I, I I definitely recommend it as an easy read. And Keen yourself, have you read yeah. anything <clears> particularly <throat> in the football? Sphere? I kind of over the last um, couple of months, uh, there was an interview in here. Um, Owen Sheen did with Michael Calvin. Uh, oh, yeah, on we have him on actually. About, is it the state the of play? State of play, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of the one that's been like uh, Michael Cavan's books have really stood out to me for one, like the depth of research that he goes into uh, in his latest book. It's the kind of the different topics that he covers. Um, like he speaks to Don Astley, um, yeah, daughter Jeff one, Astley. Yeah. yeah, it's just, but he doesn't shy away from getting into like quite serious, quite heavy topics. Um, he touches on sexism a lot, um, just about kind of the the barriers that are there for women to get into coaching and uh we had um the Manchester United manager um on I think it was maybe four or five weeks ago now uh Casey Stoney I think her name was um and she spoke a lot about that as well like the barriers that are there so I think Michael Cabin is one of those authors who really has his finger on the pulse when it comes to current topics um, and just his writing style is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, he kind of goes off the beaten track a bit because we've had him on now. Obviously, That's the Joey Barton book times, was yeah. the the one. I think we've had him on for pretty much every book since we started yeah, the show. But yeah. there was the Joey Barton one, of course, that we had him on for, and then I think the one. What else was there? There was a couple. There've been a couple uh, there of since the, the, the volcano. The, the, there actually. was the volcano. Yeah. Living on living on the volcano. Yeah, about yeah. managers and. Whatever, there was yeah. also the one where he um, uh, scouting 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 yeah. uh, the one about the, the, the nowhere. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. So and uh, yeah, and just and the fo- football factory. Just uh, well, I don't think it's called football factory, but just where he's talking about yeah. the where he basically goes into the whole thing of you know if you want to be a professional footballer and you're a child, how that works in terms of you know that that was all part part of that scout. I think that was part of that scouting book as well. Yeah, but well, anyway, he always seems to dig through things that you may have a like slight curious interest yes. in, and then he just writes it in such a good way, and then he actually speaks about it whenever yeah. you have him on. Like he's just very because mm-hmm. even when we had him, when I had him on a few months ago, we went off the beaten track a little bit, talked about that Manchester City documentary and yeah, what he thought, and about, his, thought about that. His profile continues to grow with each each book that uh, yeah that comes so out. Seen him on Sky, I think, or is it BT during the year? Anyway, like I think there was a mini documentary based off one of his books so yeah. it's obviously like it's a good thing anyway that he's getting more uh, more of a profile out of it um, the one book I picked out was an interview he did before the 2018 World Cup so it's World in Motion so it's all about the 1990 World Cup but more it's uh, Simon Hughes or sorry, sorry Simon Hart who we, I brought into studio here who went around to all the different countries and met people who were involved in those World Cups yeah. so went to Cameroon met some of the players that were involved in that met some of the English lads some of the, um, the Irish lads as a look back as well and the thing is even though the World Cup is over and maybe World Cup fever is out of the way it still feels like something you could read even over Christmas because yeah. it's it's not really rooted in what happened this year it's quite a kind of standalone thing with its own stories and Italian 90 I think he goes into uh, those yeah. s- s- some countries where the players didn't uh, so where the uh, I don't know was this I don't know was this uh, Eastern European co- countries, but basically where the players skipped the country and wouldn't come back and yeah, uh, I think uh, Italia ninety. I mean, in fairness, the tournament that changed football. I think the, it's one of those World Cups where there's a huge amount of stories. I know for that you know uh, the Irish edition obviously it's Packy Bonner and Andy Townsend. I think yeah. the English edition is Chris Waddle and uh, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's Chris Waddle. Maybe it's Paul Gascoigne. No, I think it's Chris Waddle. But anyway, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. Is um, is is I suppose everybody knows, like obviously everybody knows the Irish angle of it and the English angle really. But it's nice to read the other angles of it yeah. as well, particularly yeah. because it changed football because it was such a god awful tournament. That the football was the bad. That was the actual point in it. The football was in many ways terrible, but it was kind of the stories outside of it. Obviously, yeah. you had Gaza's tears, you had uh, Maradona, you had um, obviously our country as well doing incredibly well at the first World Cup that we've ever been at and I think people still obviously people still talk about it now it's one of those things that you think can't get away from. Do you think 2018 will be remembered fondly the World Cup? I, I think so yeah, I think wasn't, yeah. the quality uh, wise was it's actually it's pretty it's good the whole way through. In a yeah I, I think this side solely because England did well I think yeah. England kind of absorbed Ireland and that kind of feel good factor that yeah, was around people it. Even in this uh, in this office we're singing it's coming home. That's well, didn't uh, was it Guido when they won the club championship in or the the one that the county title was it county title yeah they won the county title uh, we're singing it's co- it's coming home as well so <laughs> that's so it does it does catch on. But I I, I thought that uh, the only thing I'd be interested to see is I would be surprised if. The 2018 English run in the World Cup. It could, there's no way it'll capture. It'll stand the test of time in the same way as their World Cup run in Italian '90 has stood the test of time. I don't think so. Times have changed anyway. I just think. Yeah. I just think. Time, yeah, I, I think more of it has to do probably with the fact that times have changed and, uh, like, while the World Cup is still a global event, I don't think. I don't think people possibly place as much emphasis like they enjoy it while it's on but I don't think people place as much emphasis on it anymore yeah it's a different way of consuming it because like you've obviously got social media it's like even books and things like who reads books really these days yeah. I mean it's think, times have changed I yeah. mean everything is very serialised yeah. and well, most of it's, what it's very on demand most, yeah. so yeah most, most of what I read was on uh, Kindle I have to say yeah but yeah, I, I, I would say on, Kindle, on the flip side of that like I, I, I know the way you would have that sort of saturation of you're going to have clips the whole time you're going to have reaction you're going to have this round the clock news coverage of the England team but when it still comes to the matches like people that's still like main principle of people coming together and watching the game and I don't think the emotion changes like when the England players were lined up on the halfway line and you saw the Columbia players go up and take those penalties like I would say that emotion was Exactly the same yeah, as I agree. the nineteen ninety. So I think yeah. yeah, I think on that side, but I and think uh, also uh, some uh, of the stories like yeah. we're still learning things about like football from sixties, seventies, eighties, stories that we'd never heard about. But I think now well, unless there's a few secrets that still haven't come out, but I get the sense that the way journalism works and social media 
we already kind of know pretty much everything, 99% of what's actually happening right now, and there's no kind of sense of discovery. Is it, yeah. uh, does Barney, Barney Rone have a, have a World Cup 2018 book out, or am I imagining that? He, do, he does, yeah, I yeah. don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but um, it was, uh, it does, like, like, from what I would have gathered from it was, it was that sort of, that two years post, you know, 2016, and whether you want to say, like, the English national team was hurting or it was like an embarrassment or whatever this was the kind of total flip side of that where after a match or two everyone started like oh like there's something about this team there's a lot of good talent in there we've after a the mighty Tunisia and Panama yeah like yeah but uh, it's it's one of those that like you get a couple of wins like that you get the the confidence is high um, people like want like the main thing is people want to go and watch the games. Do you know, sort of way like we from our side of things over the last year have watched Ireland games and probably said, "Gee, like why am I watching this?" Do you know, sort of way like you're watching it out of a duty to watch it because you're a supporter. But England kind of rediscovered that joy, that love of watching their team, and I, and I think that was the main part. It's something felt different, and like to a large extent, something was different because they'd gone and won a penalty shootout at a World Cup and that kind of captured the imagination. They had this very slick, cool, bearded manager who was wearing a waistcoat. It just kind of seemed everything was a little bit more younger and fresher, do you know? And, and that's not necessarily Roy Hodgson's fault, but coming off the back of that, they got rid of Roy Hodgson. They kind of moved away from the older stars, the more reliable stars, and they said, look, we're going to just trust a, a new younger team. And I think a lot of the excitement that came around the team came from those younger players. Yeah, Joe, any other books outside of... Uh, yeah, I suppose you know, the one thing i just add to the back of that, one of my f fondest memories of that was that night when England played Columbia, we recorded Team 33, and then we went oh, to yeah. the pub, one of the pubs around the corner to watch... Yeah, because I was still working. <laughs> and you came down, which did you? No, no. No, it was Killian and, it was yeah. Killian and Derek, yeah. I was tied to the desk. <laughs> but actually, the most interesting part of that was, I mean... To be honest, I was I wa I wanted I wanted England. Well, I for personal reasons because I was going to Liverpool the following week and I would be there for the semi final. I wanted England to win that shootout. So you so when they were scoring, I was like yes. But it was interesting in the pub. There was still a few like that wanted Colombia to win. You know, purely out of <laughs> they wanted spite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's one other actually that I think is uh, worth. It. I mean, there's o there's others uh, there's others like obviously there's the Kevin Keegan one, which is. Uh, a very good read great insight yeah. into his time at Newcastle in particular great insight into both his times at Newcastle the second one is probably I mean because even like you go back obviously it's nice to read the whole how he felt about um, you know he, he really had to think about the, obviously with Alex Ferguson and that's well documented uh, the second time around though his insights into Mike Ashley mm. uh, Dennis Wise comes away from yeah. it look, not looking well um, just a real good insight into how Newcastle is being run currently. Yeah, because I really. saw a few stories out. I have the book at home, and I think we were, I was trying to organise the interview pre, like during the autumn, and we might maybe in January, uh, Mr. Keegan, I think he's supposed to be in Dublin at some point in the next uh, couple of months, so hopefully we might sort something out, which means I'll actually have to read it anyway. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it's I've, heard actually, it, I've, heard, uh, it, I've it's heard it is good. And he, what, I, anyway. what I like about him, and I think most people that would uh, have watched Kevin Keegan in action, he is quite... Um, open about his own failings. He's not one of these people that comes away going, well, I'm brilliant at everything. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's quite tough on himself when it came to England manager. I think he was, he's always been quite tough on himself as, in his performance as England manager. Well, the way he, sure, when he left the England role, um, it was quite... Well, he, so they lost 1-0 to Germany, Germany and, Germany, and it was a big yeah. deal because it was the last game in the old Wembley, and uh, it was a D.D. Hammond pile driver from yeah. the range, yeah. Uh, but uh, he said that he decided to quit when he was walking from the touchline down the tunnel and the fans were booing and whatever and that's when he decided to quit and then he just quit. In the post-match interview, he quit. Yeah. And you wouldn't see, like, that was very dramatic, really. And if it happened today, it would be, whoa, like, it, it doesn't happen much. You don't see, it's very rare you would hear of a manager quitting after a football match. Yeah. Because even the Mourinho thing, I kind of got the sense he was gone. Um, after even though, I, uh, by, all, by all accounts, well, we'll get on to it, but by all accounts, he, uh, he's quite surprised that he, he was sacked. So, well, he's, he's surprised that he's not in charge for the next game. Why is he surprised? I, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe, well, who knows, but supposedly that's the, 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 the story going around allegedly is that he's surprised about the sacking. So, 
time will tell. Um, yeah. <coughs> but anyway, the, the last one I wanted to go into, sorry, I'm just, I'm just bringing up the name here on my phone. Uh, the last one I wanted to go into was Football 2.0, How the World's Best Play the Modern ga- Game uh, by Grant Wall, I think it's W-A-H-L. Uh, it's an interesting one in that um, it basically goes into the whole, you know, often, oftentimes there'd be interviews with uh, footballers from a previous generation and they talk a lot about, uh, oh, football is different in my day, uh, but like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about just, you know, going for pints and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this actually sits down with uh, some of the better known, some of the well known players. I mean, his company. Uh, there's uh, Roberto Martinez. Uh, there's Hernandez. Uh, it just talks to them about playing the game. I mean, there's like one of the stories. Martinez talks about how he has two. There's two TVs in a sitting room. Uh, it's a. It's so so. It's a perpendicular layout. So one TV is here and one TV is there. So that if he wants to watch, he watch supposedly watches. This is why he says he watches his. Uh, he watches every game that he'd be manager of. He'd watch it back ten times. All right. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. That, that's Still like can't sell I, the team to defend. I mean, even though he's watching. I mean, like <laughs> I, I, I don't know how he finds the time if you're in a Premier League season and it's, you know. But anyway, he likes to watch it ten times to try and pick up on everything. And um, do it better. So, he, he, so in is in a setup, he'd be at home with his wife, and he'll be watching. He'll be watching football on on one screen. And then she'll be watching her TV on another screen, and he'll be wearing headphones, you know, so that they're together, but he can watch uh, football. And uh, so, so th- that that's just interesting in terms of like the preparation that some coaches go through before before games and fi- figuring out what their team is doing well and not doing not so well. Another one is uh, Vincent Company just talking about you know playing the game, battling for uh, trying to win in the air. Why he's so good in the air? He'd be talking about well, being good in the air is actually all about knowing where the ball is going to land and that the space where that ball is going to land you have to fight for that space you have to get into that space and fight the other your op- opponent out of that space so that the ball will land on your head and then Hernandez talking about just how to be a good striker you know so there's some really good interest it's just really good insights so football 2.0 definitely uh, yeah. worth a look as well now we have our uh, man manning the cameras there um, I think he has a camera actually set up on himself yeah Simon McGuire say hello <laughs> he also reads books and standing beside him you can see his hand there Jonathan Higgins as well uh, for radio listeners this is really poor radio but uh, for <coughs> those who are visual uh, there's plenty there Simon um, I think we got a few tweets in actually from some of our more regular listeners of book recommendations as well. I think there was one of Michael Carrick's book from Sharon Cat Keane, so if you want to bring that up, but uh, oh no, sorry, John Patrick Daly. Um, this one, I, I heard, well, I didn't actually read it myself, but I heard a few stories around, like he was quite open about mm. feeling quite down after, I think it's the 09 um, Champions League final, Yes, which is, uh, I suppose, interesting things to learn. Michael, Michael Carrick is a great character. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think he's quite unlucky with his England career as well when you actually was, look at his ability and how underused he was. So well regarded at United and, and if the, the amazing thing about him is so well regarded by consistent United managers as well. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I think we had another one, as I mentioned, Sharon Cat Keane as well, who's one of our very regular listeners uh, who sent this in. It's the Tiger Woods book, so this isn't football, but uh, yeah. it's uh, two investigative reporters, Jeff Benedict and Armin Katayan. The second fella, he was on with Joe Malloy on Off the Ball, discussing some of the stories from the book. And the thing from what I remember from that, so I didn't get a chance to read this one either, um, Tiger comes across as a very, very strange character, and there's the cover of the book. Yeah, I, the, the, the Tiger Woods one, that's my Christmas read. That's what I'm going to be reading over the Christmas. Have uh, you had any spoilers? Uh, I know, like, I mean, I'm, I, I've read, you know, like, there's been some great work on Tiger Woods down through the years, and I mean, to be honest, as, as you know, I think like like anybody with an interest in golf, you, you, you are rooting for him now. I mean, it would be phenomenal if you want I think he's it. changed. I don't know what, maybe he, that was always there in the book, but it seems like when he won that tournament you could actually see uh, like a level of emotion that you'd never ah, seen yeah before. well I mean it, it would be the if if he comes back to win a major particularly if he comes back to win a masters it would be to be honest, to be honest it would be a, an equivalent modern day rocky kind of story in that yeah. you don't have you, like I, me- I remember reading uh, you know he was talking about how uh, oh well I spent most of my day playing video games and he was playing Call of Duty or something like that because he couldn't really do anything else he couldn't walk yeah. and uh if you're talking about coming back to actually win, and particularly in today's game where everything is, you know, broken down to the most minimal in whatever sport you're playing, golf or whatever, if he can come back, 
to win a major, it'd be an unbelievable story. But uh, 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 anyway, th in this book, they've done great work. I, they, they have a huge amount of interviews. I think it's with, I think they've interviewed over four hundred people. Yeah, including um, I think they were talking to like his high school girlfriend yeah. and things like and, that. And they did reach out, and they reached out a few times to try and get him to do it. But obviously, he, yeah, he, I he think didn't. Um, I read somewhere. I think it was a Katayan got in touch, and Tigers were at least through his representatives. The response was, "Who have you spoken to already? What yeah. stories have you already got?" and Obviously, they you know you don't want to be doing an interview under conditions where it's semi-controlled. Controlled, yeah. yeah. Like uh, there was, there's another story. I don't know if this is in the book, but there is one other story about he, you know, because his father was was his father a Navy SEAL or anyway, he has this thing about the Navy SEALs mm. uh, and he was training with the Navy SEALs or something. And afterwards, uh, they they all went out to dinner, but like. Uh, uh, that they were waiting for him to like pick up the check. check and I don't think he did and then like I mean look that's one story but like another one was that they were t uh, they were taking golf shots uh, I, I don't know who this was with but uh, uh, so they're all driving the ball and then Tiger comes up Tiger gets down on his knees and holds the club like a baseball bat and swings the ball off the tee and still drives it f uh, farther than uh, further than uh, than any of the rest of them. But it was just kind of like everyone was like, "It's just bizarre." I mean, you're openly mocking us almost, mm. you know. So it, it's know. one of those books I would imagine. Anyway, I'm <clears throat> I'm still yet to to delve into it. But with the length and breadth of work that's already been done regarding Tiger Woods, it really would need to be something that was to yeah. totally. Like n not perhaps not invasive, but it would have to be something that a real difference because you couldn't really sell it. I don't think otherwise. Like I imagine there's enough out there now that we would have known yeah. a base level of Tiger Woods, whereas this seems to scratch the surface a lot more to yeah. to really get an idea of who he was and and just like little things like that that he would try and uh, kind of impose himself as someone who would be perhaps a little bit more superior in yeah, whatever aspect story of life. Like the house he used to rent in Augusta, so I think it's a lady called Peggy Lewis. Yeah. So he was introduced to her one year, like he'd been staying at this house for at least for, I don't know, how, I'm not sure how long or however long he had been um, playing at the Masters and he was introduced to this lady and he didn't even acknowledge her. He turns yes, to, I read yeah, that story. It was yeah. just a really, yeah. really bizarre story. Yeah. Like, uh, who, like who does that? Yeah, it's just uh, uh, by all accounts, uh, all the reviews of it have been extremely positive. And I mean, most radio apart from I'd say from Tiger, not that <laughs> he's spoken about it publicly. A lot, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, daytime radio station uh, radio stations have done their end of year book reviews, and it, it's in the sports section. And his seems to be consistently near the top. Yeah, um, in terms of like the best one you've ever read, though, is there anything that kind of soccer out? soccer book? It can be soccer or whatever it is. Uh, um, I've liked I've a couple. I mean, you've read it as well. Um, uh, a, a life too short. Yeah, we actually have I think a picture of the cover because we had um, yeah. Ronald Rang, the writer, um, who was Robert Denke. Yeah, it's an amazing um, book. It is incredible. Um, it's just, I mean, great insight into professional football. Amazing insight into into the, the strain of professional football. Uh, and an amazing insight into depression. Mm. Uh, so I highly like it's a, it's a powerful, powerful read. Just definitely leaves you thinking afterwards. Yeah. Uh, another one. I mean, it's quite old now, uh, but the Miracle of Castle de Sangro or is the Italian clothes, yeah, yeah, remains one of my personal favourites. It's uh, it came out in like 1995, 96. You can obviously still get it. Uh, you can still you can still get it in most bookshops, mm. I think. But uh, it was by uh, John McGuinness, who uh, sadly passed away a couple of years ago. But um, basically, he was uh, he's an American author. He didn't have a huge amount of interest in football at the time, or soccer as the Americans called it, and obviously the, uh, the World Cup came to USA in 94 and he all of a sudden picked up this big interest in it and decided uh, he was going to go to Italy to uh, write about this football club uh, population, the, the Castel, Castel de Sangro uh, population in the town 10,000, they've been promoted to Serie B. Uh, it was the season 95-96, I think, or maybe it was 94-95, I think it was 95-96. Mm. But anyway, um, uh, promoted it, and to be honest, the book reads like a Hollywood movie. I've spoken about it before, but the amount of things that happen to that club in their season... Not a couple of deaths or something as there's, well, yeah. yeah, we won't spoil... I don't want to... Go, I mean, if you're talking, I suppose... Yeah, it actually happens, yeah. It, yeah. But, yeah. like, I, I mean, like, yeah, there are. There are yeah. a couple of tragedies at the club. There's a, an insane ending to the season. Um, th th it's all about staying up. Yeah. And uh, it's it's an unbelievable read. And, it, and like, uh, even though the book is 20 years old, it definitely stands the test of time. Yeah, I was going to pick out, and I brought it in actually because I have it at home. I didn't, I forgot I had it. But the damned United. Now, obviously, there are people who uh, 
I, I, I wasn't a great. I was, I was very. I dropped it halfway through. Did you? Yeah, and I, I think I read it the whole way it. through. A few, year, well. few years ago, now I, I started reading it and I dropped it halfway through. I, I, I enjoyed it in terms of the slight insight into Brian Clough, even though it is it's, fictional. It's a, it's a fascinating approach yeah. to Brian Clough. Yeah. And it, what, what, what got me was that I, I just the style where he'd repeat the same sentence a few times for emphasis on how Clough would think. Yeah. I, I just, it, I, it kind of it, it just grated on me personally, I yeah. have to say. It is very different though. So it's, it's very it's different. It's probably the most different of any mean, of the books I've read in terms of sports. How you, <clears throat> sorry, how do you find it in the sense that like, it, in not all of it is based in fact, like it, for me it would really have to be one or the other. Yeah, like I, I couldn't I was able to detach myself from it anyway. Yeah. Um, I yeah. suppose it just takes you back to that world of 1970s football, which we've approached in other different ways. Yeah. But it was just kind of like something I used to read on the train on the way up between here and like Leitrim and stuff. So it was just it was interesting because Did, again, uh, I think you can detach reality because I don't remember. Obviously, I wasn't around in the 70s, so yeah. or the 60s, so I have no real. Um, no, of, and like yeah, a lot yeah. of those games weren't televised. The movie is brilliant. Yeah, the jam shit. It's actually one of the best football movies. Michael I've Sheen, I think, is Michael movie, Sheen yeah. plays. Yeah, Michael, Michael Sheen actually, is fantastic. It's, it's actually yeah. a brilliant movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, recommend watching it if you haven't. The one and I haven't <laughs> actually even finished it. But <laughs> I am the last. I was uh, I was reading this in China. No, because, no, no. Uh, book review would be complete <laughs> without. No, it. Um, and I haven't. Yeah, I haven't even finished it yet. But I like. Obviously, he doesn't like uh, Guardiola. Loves Mourinho. Um, and there's some interesting stuff from his childhood. Actually, it's probably yes. even the stuff, even outside of the football, the football stuff. Actually, in most of these books, you kind, especially if it's somebody like Zlatan, who you would remember his entire career. Yeah. it's not quite as interesting. But the stuff about his childhood, growing up in a rough part of Malmo in Sweden, it's uh, it's just interesting because you kind of learn like where does this fella come from? Why is he kind of the way he is? Like he's possibly the most arrogant footballer of our generation and yeah. Yeah. this is in a world where Cristiano Ronaldo exists so uh, could I add one in uh, Raph just yeah, go for it. The, while we're on it um, or the subject matter today Jamie Jackson has a book called The Season in the Red and it follows the immediate years post Fergie so he has <clears throat> David Moyes uh, first, se- first and only season in charge of Manchester United and then he has Louis van Gaal's first season as well and I think the further down the line we go the more people appreciate that book because it's good but it kind of dips into like there was this result then we had this result then this happened and when you I don't think that translates massively well into a very easily readable book Mm -hmm. but the more time that goes past I think people will look back on David Moyes 10 months in charge and be a little bit more fascinated by that Um, so I think Jamie Jackson's Season in the Red is quite good because it gives you the contrast the contrast between the two managers and it like he's the reporter on the Manchester beat yeah. so he like has that inside track on everything else and I think that inside over time will get a little bit more or, or will be valued that little bit higher um, and then Jonathan Wilson as well oh yeah uh, see, uh, inverting the pyramid yeah uh, and he's, a, he's another one he, he another one came out not that long ago about Premier League tactics uh, yeah, I think Michael Cox might have written. Oh, was it Michael yeah, Cox? Yeah, yeah, yeah we had one, Michael yeah, Cox yeah, on. Yeah, I think yeah. around the time, the mixer is that the one you're yeah, doing? Yeah, 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 that was yeah. Cox. Yeah, yeah sorry. but I, I that thought was actually decent. Yeah. Um, yeah, but inverting the pyramid for those if you're a tactics nerd or you're into yeah. like what football clubs or formations were like going through from the 19 whatever. He uh, writes. He beginning. writes. Uh, he writes beautifully as well. Yeah, he does. He's not quite Barney Ronnie in terms of like Barney Ronnie is still the uh, person I'd always look to as like the yeah. the best in the business. Yeah. But Jonathan Wilson is obviously good, and it's yeah. a brilliant book yeah. as well. Yeah. It, it's it's one of those books that it does take a while to sit down, and like you have to want to read it, and you kind of what have to have the interest. You couldn't just pick it up because yeah. it is it's quite dense. Mm-hmm. Um, like you when you pick you it up, a, you do need to be a yeah, soccer yeah. nerd. Like you know, if you you need to be into soccer and all that. Yeah, stuff. and he's going into stuff like the yeah. Austrian coffee, the Vienna coffee houses, and all yeah. this stuff, yeah. and how like tactics came about in, in Central Europe, and then that gets spread around. Or the you know the Scottish school of football with like I think they were they kind of brought about short passing and that kind of thing. Mm. So yeah. it's it's interesting. And then he goes off to places like but, Dino but Kiev, you're, et cetera. You're right. It's quite. It is. It's it's tough it's, to get it's quite into dense. Not, yeah. yeah, but I I think it's one of those that. Christmas is probably the time to do it yeah. because you'll end up having a decent wedge of time you to sit down talk to your family and friends yeah and it's it's a good excuse like go and read 25 30 pages at a go or however many just so you can get yourself into it but you could bake through it over the Christmas and it's 
excellent. Like the depth of research, knowledge, everything is just excellent. Yeah, and obviously you were doing the piece with Nutmeg Magazine, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago we had yeah. on the show, and obviously he has the blizzard, so he's one of those that actually, like football literature is kind of like his Yeah, like the, I think thing. the guys, um, I was at a, a talk only recently, it was the con, art, or con artist put it on, it was the blizzard, yeah. um, but it was Jonathan Wilson, Miguel Delaney, and Philippe Beauclair, and when you just sit down and listen to them talk about it, that the way they'll like just have a bit of a laugh, but just the depth of knowledge mm. that they have, it's just They've had fascinating some, There are some very to. unique approaches to uh, yeah. football writing in the blizzard. I mean, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but mm. there, there are, like, that, like you know, there's a couple of, there is, like, like when Saturday comes, the blizzard, there's yeah. some really good, uh, um, there is, there's some really good writing out there. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, like, I mean, in fairness, the coverage of The Guardian is unbelievable as well. Yeah. Anyway, I think that sums us up nearly for our uh, book review section, um, unless there's anything to add, which, no. No, I don't think so. Faces, I, I, think don't. No, I think we've covered everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and anyway, you can tweet us in more recommendations yeah. to at Team Thirty Three as well. So I wish I could. I wish I had time to read more. That's the thing. Like yeah. life has changed. And the bloody, point. Uh, the bloody smartphone. Oh, yeah, reading but it, reading nonsense. Something I found. I used to always read if I was on a train or a bus or whatever it is, and now I actually because you, you, you have Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah, on, you're just like, there, like yeah. you're mindlessly scrolling, and you're like, oh my god, I, I could actually be doing. I could be I mean, learning. I'm, I'm a firm believer in like you know, leisure time is great time, but I'm a firm believer in actually. Feeling, doing so, like by doing something with your leisure time, I mean like you watch a TV show on Netflix, or you watch your favorite TV show, or you watch a match, or you you uh, you read a book, or whatever. Like I'm a firm believer in that because you know sometimes you have a spare hour, and actually you waste about 40 minutes of it there just mindlessly scrolling through your phone. And the worst, at the end of the it, worst thing now is even like if you have a film on Netflix, um, and then you're just actually oh, you're not watching. I, it, like. Yeah, but now there's I know it's a good film if my phone is actually sitting Since far, far away, away from you, yeah. far away from you, and I'm not even looking yeah. at it. But I find like too many films, particularly the Hollywood stuff, yeah, because you know like about halfway through you'll know how this is going to end, and you yeah. can work out the the story arc, and then you're just on the phone, you're on Twitter looking at nothing. And you don't this remember is, what you're this is and you come, away, you come away from it and you kind of go, like, well, I, I, like, what, where's that hour ago? I didn't actually yeah, learn I don't, anything. And to be honest, or yeah. do anything. I did ask, absolutely yeah. nothing. Like. Ask me about that film in about two hours' time. I couldn't tell you yeah. what happened either. But anyway, uh, that's our lives. So we'll be back after the break <laughs> with Jose <laughs> Mourinho. Also, winners and losers. Jonathan Higgins outside will be jumping in as well. And then we're going to bring in Enda Call as well. So uh, join us in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to Team 33's Christmas specials. We're moving on to other matters. Uh, actually, we might start off on Jose Mourinho, actually, because we're hey. recording this on the day where, <laughs> where he, uh, he lost his job at Man United. And I think, as we were saying earlier, or as Joe was saying earlier, apparently he's surprised. I can't see why he would be well, surprised. Well, he's not surprised. I'm sorry, before I, I, yeah. you actually start in, Jonathan Higgins is yes. in the studio on end of call, as promised as well. So <laughs> if you're wondering who these two randomers are, <laughs> that's who they are. Uh, I don't think he's surprised that he was sacked. I think the story is just the headline. Or in so terms of timing. It was just that he was surprised that he's gone so quickly. He thought, uh, he thought, well, he thought he'd be in charge for the next game at the weekend, and probably he thought he'd be in charge for the Christmas. I mean, to be honest with you, there was a few articles written after the Liverpool game that basically he can't be sacked because United don't have a successor lined up, and yeah, um, uh, there, yeah, like I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, well, the like his, his payoff is supposedly twenty-two or twenty-four million sterling, so. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> too badly. Yeah. I think so. Somebody was saying awful to sack somebody, awful to put someone out of a job the week before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're getting twenty-four I million. Mean, Shane, I mean, Shane Hannan was saying to me that he, he felt sorry for Jose. I was like, no, no. What? If, there's pe- if there's anyone in football you don't feel sorry for, <laughs> it's probably Jose. But you don't feel sorry for Premier League managers. I'd never feel sorry for. Should they get massive payoffs? Why would you feel and sorry? You won't, for being, you won't have to spend Christmas in a hotel yeah. now, as well, so it's win-win, isn't it? I've always said being like a mid to lower level Premier League manager is the best job you can have because you you only it's have to work payoffs. for about six months in a year, <laughs> get sacked, get a nice payoff, <laughs> get another and then Take another seven months off, go out, go again. have a sun holiday, and then you come back. Well, as we as we were saying, uh, I think w- as we were saying earlier, uh, David, uh, who was it? Uh, it's been tweeted a few times that uh, David Moyes' contract, original contract with United, still has five months to run. Yeah, that's a scary thought. Actually, it's amazing. Like it's incredible, really, isn't it? And it, it's like going back to it, like the weekend. Obviously, triggered all this, and you know the funny thing goes in. I was doing a preview piece of the weekend, and it was like. Klopp had won in eight games, or he's winless in eight games against Mourinho. But this is the third sacking for Mourinho on the back of a heavy Klopp 
a three yes. one defeat actually yeah. I think and it's yeah, so like it was uh, four three years and a day yeah, or something four, I think, four one his Dortmund team thumped Real Madrid that led to I think four months later they sacked him two years later there was the three one at Stamford Bridge he didn't last very long after that yeah and the three one at the weekend is it just a couple of days but, but like to be honest like I mean yeah when he was hired we were, there was an element of us going oh you know United will win a Premier League title and all that but now. I mean, when you really reflect on it, I, at the same time, I did feel when he was hired that it would play out the exact same way his second stint to Chelsea has played out because yeah. that seems to be the reoccurring theme now that uh, Mourinho gets something out of the team, then they all fall out with him and stop playing for him, and then he leaves. And like that happens at Chelsea, it's happened here in yeah. Madrid as I, well. I distinctly remember when they got when they hired him because uh, I was still in college at the time and we're still we were doing a, a sports show then. And I was asked what I thought of the appointment. And I thought about it for a while and I thought it was a terrible decision because I couldn't imagine where United go after Mourinho at that stage I, because all the good managers were taken up, Zidane was still in work, and I still... Three years have passed and nothing's changed. The, all the best managers are still in work, United are still a disaster, and Jose Mourinho has changed nothing. And now United are left with the situation that I thought would happen three years ago they don't know nobody's who to bring. There's this. nobody there. There's, but there's nobody surprised that this has this has panned out. Okay, maybe it's gone a bit more off the wall than we would have thought. I, d I don't think a lot of like I thought it wouldn't end well and it would peter out like this. I didn't this, think this, this season seems to be going. I, I it's going worse than I thought it yeah, would. I go. didn't think it would go completely off a cliff. Yeah. But like United fans, kind of a lot of them, kind of well, obviously he had you know minimum success, the couple of couple of cups. Um, they kind of watered over the crack in a way. They were probably the worst thing that ever happened because it just kept them in in for another world in a little bit longer. That they weren't really evolving. The team never evolved. The team has gone completely off off a cliff now. But nobody's really surprised. We predicted this months ago um, that it would happen, and it was a very short term decision from the board or whoever made the decision in Manchester United. And I think it'll turn out if they look back on it, this is a worse uh, appointment than Miles was. There is no sense yeah. of continuity because, yeah. like, you look at City; they went from Pellegrini to Guardiola, and like they still kind of played more or less I, 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 some, but, but more or less same football. I mean, whereas yeah, well, City yeah. obviously have See, City, City always wanted. Guardiola. Guardiola. No, yeah. you could argue that maybe United always wanted Mourinho, or well, certainly Mourinho always wanted the United. Them, yeah. But I mean, but there's no continuity between like Moyes no. is footballing wise so different to Van Hal, who is yeah. so different to, to Mourinho. Mourinho. So yeah. like you're jumping, lurching from one extreme to the like, other. And it's you know, it's I mean, usually you'd be kind of going, well, like I mean, they finished second last season and they won a couple of cups, but it's just that they're getting absolutely hammered. The, the, hammered the, now. the second place last season yeah. again watered over the yeah, cracks a little did, bit more, did. like. I think that position was completely distorted to give a false representation of what yeah. that United squad is capable of and where they were going under him. Because whoever, like, so someone's going to take the job until the end of the season and then they're going to go big. Gigs. Give the gigsy for the end of the Carrick short term, they'll get like a. Is Carrick in charge for two days? I would imagine they won't until. until I think like he's, he's, they're taking training, yeah. but uh, yeah. by the time this actually probably goes oh, out, they'll, they'll have to be the others. Yeah. So, Finger in. So, 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 so reality is, they're getting somebody <laughs> That'd in. That'd be a great story. <laughs> that would be unbelievable. Oh, there we go. There I'd we go. love no, if Wenger like, came in and won the Champions uh, League. Uh, that would be I'd the love, greatest I'd football story of the year. But I'd love if they. I'd love if they went for. Like, I mean, like, forget about like United taking on us. I just love if they went from some mad. Appointment that it would like you go, this is going to be great crack like Roy Keane or something daft like that. But I know they won't. But, it, but it's I would, they, they might do because <laughs> <laughs> this board are completely, they are as much uh, culpable for this situation as Mourinho is, if not more. It's like what Neville was, was saying on uh, before the match that they, they've done an absolute clusterfuck. They've they've created this. They've they give him a three year contract. It's after the watershed. You're okay. <laughs> Good stuff. I was like, they've given him they've given him a new contract going into the third year when everyone knows that Jose Mourinho's uh, third year is always a disaster. That didn't yeah. make sense at all to me. That one, whatever. Like you knew he was going to peter yeah. out. Get yeah. it, whatever about the appointment, what I think was was wrong. It will turn out to be when you look back it'll turn out to be one of the most worst decisions that they've made in recent yeah. years but to give them the extension is, is unthinkable it was nobody, nobody thought that was a good idea and the Glazers have been sucking money out of the club for years Ed Woodward is a disaster when it comes to nego negotiating contracts David De Gea and Martial they're, they've had to uh, bring in an extension onto their contracts because they can't they just can't sit down and negotiate a contract because of the disaster the club's in at the moment like, this is a big job 
And it, the one thing the board can be given credit for is that they got rid of Mourinho now, so that they have six months to get a sporting director in. They can well, is it is line it, up Poch or whoever? Is it, it is. short term? So yeah, obviously, actually, sorry, you mentioned Pochettino. Um, I think Simon is either shaking his head. He's a Tottenham <laughs> fan, so uh, thumbs up. Well, I mean, everyone's <laughs> yeah. gonna, uh, I it's mean, a good thing he didn't turn the, the camera the, on himself the, there. Actually, the, for a the second, the tapping up of Pochettino has already begun. I mean, from the United faithful, I mean, we saw we saw Gary Neville tweet. Uh, 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 you know the Paul Pogba story about caption this, and he said caption this, do one. <laughs> yeah, actually, we've the uh, we've the original Pogba. Yeah, <laughs> I actually really <laughs> wish. Um, I was very disappointed to find out that that was a scheduled post. I yeah. kind of figured it. Ha- yeah. When so, I saw when yeah, I saw, when so I saw the we, hashtag here to create radio listeners, this is obviously yeah. the uh, the social media post that went out on Pogba's account. <laughs> caption this at Man United. <laughs> hashtag week. Man United. <laughs> hashtag MUFC at Adidas Football. Hashtag here to create. So and it's definitely it, a yeah, it's sponsor. It, yeah, post. it was yeah. a spa- and then they took it down. It's fantastic, though. Yeah, how funny would well, that have been? It's, it's it's more because it's it's all because of the expression on his face. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, if I, like, what's it him playing football or doing anything? It's him giving the there basic. He is, yeah, yeah, like, look at that for <laughs> look at that for a smug <laughs> smile. You know. It's the uh, it's a hashtag here to create as well. <laughs> the exact same thing that he wasn't allowed to do under Jose Mourinho. Yeah, but like, even if that is that, so that's a sponsors tweet whatever by a PR company surely a PR company has more cop on to realise okay this is a massive well no you would be and then somebody forgot that this well, is yeah, there. Can't there was, forget, I think like there, was, there was 40 minutes between the announcement and that going up so it could easily have been that someone just forgot because he could have a load of we don't know if he could have a load of schedule did you like see um, Kyle Walker's response to it no, no. he uh, put up a tweet saying who deletes tweets these days <laughs> and retweeted the screenshot of it <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, look. So, but it's short-term manager to win the champion, trying to go, win the Champions League, yeah, and, and then a new, a new no, one. Yeah. A new, I has, will. It has to be short-term manager to get Champions League football. Yeah, hand it over because I think one of the one of the issues, and it was reported widely yesterday, was that uh, one of the problems with Jose Mourinho was that United are trying to appoint a director of football and a sporting director. But he wanted control over who was to get that job, and that was one of the biggest issues that the board were having because they, like the Anthony Martial contract situation, they weren't willing to sell Martial knowing that Jose Mourinho may be out the door in the next six months. So to give him uh, powers over bringing in a director of football who's going to oversee the direction of the club for the next 10 years, hopefully, would be a, an even worse situation than handing Jose Mourinho a, a new contract. Yeah. Uh, he is one of the losers of the year, and we haven't done a winners oh. and losers segment for. Um, <laughs> I wrote Raph. I hope you're going to put the sting in for this. <laughs> Not on YouTube, in case we get pinged for <laughs> copyright. Oh, well, I probably shouldn't say that. This is getting edited out, actually. By the way. Um, but in for the radio version. Yes. Um, now, of course, winners and losers segment returning just for the very end of the year. Um, Mourinho certainly is one now. Keenan O'Neill, of course, would be their regime would be down as losers. I think for the year. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Uh, I mean, they had a terrible year. I mean, look, I, I don't really think we. There's not much else we can say. No, about we Keenan. said enough. I mean, I think everyone is tired. I think everyone wants a break from Ireland <laughs> for a couple of months. Yeah, until the McCarthy. Uh, I, I Keenan, Keenan O'Neill, uh, Manchester United. I mean, like, who else would you go Germany. for? Germany. Germany, Germany, bad year yeah. for Germany. Nations a, League, World Cup, etc. Yeah, that was so, a calamity, really, wasn't yeah. it? Um, Arsene Wenger. Yeah, he'll be a winner again. To well, he'll probably be a winner. I mean, Wenger has probably dealt with it quite well in that he's stayed completely away from the club. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work to do there yet, though. Yeah, he's not end up in the stands like Ferguson shaking his head. As, yeah. Well, he has no <laughs> reason is, to this, shake this his head. This is anyway, awful, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, winners. Well, go on. Go Football for, only? Uh, yeah. Um, Lapetegui. Oh, yeah, yeah. Disaster. major loser this yeah, year, big time, mm. on I, multiple counts. Yeah, I would have said TV terribly. consumers as well. Actually, based off some of our chats earlier in the yes, year around, yes. <laughs> you have so many different uh, you know, yeah. services to pick from. The eleven sports is most eleven sports profile, now, which looks like it's coming towards an end. And you know, I'm not going to name names, but there's just so much out there that people have to buy if they want to watch every single match. So that's one I think for me that definitely would be down on the losers and the cost of it. Oh yeah, the cost. Yeah, but it's not it's not a good time if you're a football TV consumer because there's barely anything on terrestrial. 
you know, more and more football seems to be going. I mean, there is an awful lot of football on TV in the first place. Still is, yeah. But, but more and more, the important stuff is you going. You need multiple subscriptions yeah, now, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Even the Champions League's gone from terrestrial. Yeah, Wednesday, you know, a lot of that. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't for think that would happen. I have to say, but um, uh, happened. Uh, it has happened. Modern football has got more expensive for everybody, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the major winners. I mean, if we're going for the whole year now, the major winner is Liverpool. Liverpool are the most impressive team of the year. Yeah, yeah, like from a from a. I like I, well, I, 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 maybe not. Well, it's probably maybe a, a leap to say of the year, but they're certainly the, because obviously we're forgetting about City there. And where yeah. they've come from, I think. Yeah, though. yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the fact that there was a clip doing the rounds. I think it was yesterday. Uh, just a report on from from Spain, and it was just speaking about briefly. Just summary was like two Spanish teams didn't want Liverpool in the Champions League and they, that was the team they wanted to avoid. Like yeah. Liverpool were a calamity when, when Klopp took over. We were an absolute farce and we were a farce for, for quite a while. And, you it's know, taken him a time. It's, it's it's has taken time. A, it has taken a long time and yeah. has taken him a lot more time than he initially thought was. Yeah. Well, if you go back to his, his first Pref he he he'd calculated that he would, would have won the league by now. now yeah. We still have on trophies, and it's the age-old ar- argument, really. But you know, Mourinho won the trophies. Is that better than than Liverpool's progress? I think the progress has to stand for it because you can see yeah. an evolution where we're going. Like the, from a personal point of view, the Champions League run last season, I know it ended an absolutely calamity with a, a certain goalkeeper, mm-hmm. but there was there were some magical it's times. The there were some well. magical journeys. Yeah. Uh, it did take club uh, three years to win a trophy with, or win the league. Sorry, with Dortmund as well. So it's it's not as if. His process is instantaneous as well. It is a process. If he does manage to do it, I mean, I can't believe I'm back actually talking now again about Liverpool win the week, having completely written them off a couple of weeks ago. If he does manage to do it, it will be a phenomenal achievement because, I mean, any other season, like any, if you take out last year and this year, any other season, even Arsenal with their run will be doing very well in the top, you know. Like, it's just that, like, City and Liverpool have just so far ahead of everybody trail, else. But yeah. it's yeah. not even like the, the, so the two of them are at the top of the table and the two of them are bashing out the points. It's incredible how, how high the standard is. Like the standard is Any other year, as yeah. you said, that yeah. one of those is a walkaway yeah. leader and we're talking about, oh, it's another year where they don't, wanna, don't have a title chase. But it's it's everything got to do with the clubs. Like City, as much as you loathe them for the questionable stuff off the field, we won't get into that. But from a footballer point of view, what yes. they're doing is phenomenal. Yes. What they're doing for the community there is phenomenal. It's all about the academy, structures. Even the ladies' teams, there's a structure yeah. in place. If Guardiola goes away in the morning, there's still a, a, a structure in place. Liverpool is, is not quite there, yeah. it's getting there. But the football is, the whole evolution has come along. And how, how few points? And their head to head is actually coming up yeah. as well um, on January 3rd. So that's going to be. That's quite fat, interesting. That's be yeah. But there, be how bad. few points the bottom 10, say in particular, are picking up is really eye catching. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was. I I mean, like Southampton beating Arsenal was a real, you know, in that like Arsenal are probably, you know, I mean Chelsea and Arsenal are the only ones that seem to really uh, mess up at, against the the weaker teams at the. Uh, well, Arsenal haven't. Well, they've had draws and stuff, but you know, in that like, if we, like City and Liverpool have continued to beat them, Spurs, to be honest, like, they've lost four, but I don't think they have. They have a draw, I don't think. But it's after a wobbly start, they've really turned yeah. around as well. Um, Pochettino deserves great credit for that because. I wrote them off at the start of the season. I thought they were done. That so many players coming back. That's late. and this the, so many like it's Liverpool's best ever start to a to a Premier League season or to a season. To I a think. season, yeah. Uh, it's it's Spurs' best ever start to a was it a Premier League season or a season? But Spurs are enjoying their best ever start to a season as yeah, well. Still a little yeah. way off the top. Yeah, Simon doesn't. Yeah, at least he should probably be pointing at the camera. At Can I add a point. couple of uh, more losers? Yes. Just I just want to pile in the pressure. I've not, I haven't picked a winner yet, but I'm going to pick a, a couple of more losers. Neymar is definitely a loser this year. Yeah. Moved to PSG to win the Ballon d'Or. Ended up finishing it outside the top ten in the Ballon d'Or. Came even more disliked as well. Than um, yeah, his reputation's got yeah. ruined. Nick Kovac. Feel a little bit sorry for him because the Baron job just came a little bit too soon. I'm not really sure why they appointed him. Uh, Thierry Henry is definitely another loser, but I also think he may turn things around if he's not as clueless as he looks but he looks fairly clueless at the minute yeah it's not and exactly worked out well so I think Villa and was it Bordeaux I think they've dodged a uh, bullet, yeah. bullet there yeah. yeah he's probably like I mean Monaco though has sold off an awful lot of their yeah no like he yeah, like in fairness they were in dire straits when he came in yeah. he just hasn't um, turned the uh, situation around they had 16 injuries when he came in yeah. So that's so, that's yeah. There are mitigating pretty, circumstances, that, yeah. but he hasn't. He also looks extremely clueless on the sideline. He does, yeah. yeah. And uh, the press conference thing did it for me. Really push in, push in your chair there, mate. Luke. Oh, it just yeah. was yeah. cringe. Uh, yeah. Like if you're doing that sort of stuff in public, you have to be backing it up. And uh, you have to be winning a lot of matches. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
won more set of losers and that's kind of texting a lot of people a lot of losers a sure. lot of losers for 2018 everyone who voted in the Ballon d'Or Lionel yeah, Messi is the fifth, best, fifth, best, player the fifth the best player in the world according to those who voted in the Ballon d'Or and that for for me makes every single one of the people who voted him it would have been different had it not been a World Cup year though I think I was glad, yeah. I was glad uh, Luka Modric won uh, yeah, yeah I was, I was happy but I think him. Messi's way too low like number ah, five yeah, is, yeah, he, he probably should be number two or three maybe it's just it's a World Cup year I suppose I know, yeah. but it, it is at the end of the day, it's a competition on yeah. the best yeah, player in the world. Yeah. But not it's the timing of the vote, the it's people's perception. The yeah, World exactly. Cup distorts everything. Because he did have a, but a, a wobble, like he was still unbelievable. Even to consider Anton Griezmann ahead of him. Yeah. I know Griezmann won That's the World, the world, Cup, World Cup. Varane also won the World Cup. He wasn't anywhere near the top five. So it's, it's an argument based on that. And just while we're on the Ballon d'Or, the DJ that asked. Uh, the female <laughs> first female Ballon d'Or oh, yeah, winner ever to horrible. twerk on stage oh, biggest God. loser of 2018 oh. here, here. but uh, winner is actually I was going to go France and actually our predictive skills or I'm just going to go Joe's predictive skills actually because he's the only one who uh, got it right because normally when we predict something we tend to jinx people <laughs> and countries and nations and whatever it is but for once uh, uh, somebody actually got a prediction right I wasted right. them well from the outside as well yeah, yeah. I do, uh, in our preview of the tournament yeah actually. preview of the tournament we actually yeah. played it out yeah. on the or just after the final as well because yeah. it, it just doesn't happen in our it, well it, I mean it wasn't it wasn't exactly a hard thing I mean like the, if you looked at their team on paper they seemed to have the best structure in place and that you weren't looking at it going yeah like they've got great players but you know they focus too much on just mm. on, on giving the ball to uh, Mbappe or whatever you know it wasn't like looking at Brazil with Neymar where you're like everything goes through Neymar um, they just seem to have the best, the best setup, and and they won. They, they won the World Cup without being spectacular. Did they get out of second, third gear? Not really. Part maybe a part of the Argentina game was Perhaps, about the only yeah. time where you, you felt like they, if they wanted to, if they needed to let off the hammer, they could have gone a bit more. I felt there was more. They just have the, but they have the certain. So on on paper and now in real and now in the and now on the field, so they have the best team, yeah. international team. You've, you like you would have said Mbappe about four years ago. Just individually. Mbappe is, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. But four years ago going into the Euros you would have said that this team if they don't win the Euros they're likely going to win the World Cup because they had that base of the team yeah. and they didn't even have Mbappe at that stage so yeah. he added the magic and he was the main man at the World Cup yeah now before we go and end our Christmas special actually because we did documentaries last year I think you're the only one who's actually watched or Joe have you watched a bit of the Sunderland documentary uh, you know? oh, sure. yeah, I, I, I I, I'm still meaning to watch the Manchester City one Raf. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go in terms of my watching in Netflix yeah. but uh, no I'm hoping to watch the Manchester City yeah. one over the next uh, anyway, it's Sunderland until I die so you've seen a bit of it anyway. yeah I've seen the first uh, four episodes is that any use? it's um, it's very mu much uh, made for an American audience like they have cutaways explaining the what the, cha what the championship is how many teams are in it right, the bottom three get relegated the playoff situations all that there apart from that it's very very slickly put together it's like a the Juventus lot. one then, because that one was slick. It was just um, shite. Yeah, the Juventus. <laughs> this one's better than what the Juventus one is because there's actual interesting things going on at Sunderland during the, the year that they found it. It was originally supposed to be a film about their uh, rise from the back. ashes, from the championship back up. Uh, <laughs> I uh, that and the the first episode is, is uh, Darren Gibson's drunken rant saying that half the players aren't committed. Uh, so that kind of get. It, that sets the That's tone. That's what you want in a documentary. It's though. fantastic, that bit. Uh, and then the third episode was really interesting. It follows the deadline day de deals where um, the, you're following the chief executive, which you give actually very, very good access to him. Um, doing the deals, the one time they switch off the camera is uh, when there's a like a ten, they've got 10 minutes to make a deal happen. So he's just like, all right, good luck, lads. Go, go, go away now. I have to make this happen. And it didn't go through. And that's where the tension starts to build with the uh, with the manager. Mm. Uh, so that's where I left it off. I, I think uh, it's a great way to for a club to ra like. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable way really for a club to raise their profile. Mm. Yeah. Like it's a great idea for Sunderland because you're watching them going, oh yeah, Sunderland. You know, like it is a great way to raise your profile. Spoiler alert: they went down. <laughs> <laughs> if, if speaking about if we're doing football documentaries, the one that I have to throw throw out there is the Graham Hunter. Um, documentary oh, on his book get the ball past the ball, the, yeah. pa take the ball, the ball. Past the ball yeah. incredible piece of uh, uh, of TV it, it's a must watch for any football fan yeah. going into it I used to love Barcelona as a kid I have to say they kind of um, 
the waters were a little more, little, little bit more choppy the last couple of years. The way they the transfer uh, negotiated a lot of the transfers against Liverpool and <laughs> were very questionable about some of the stuff and pu- bullied themselves around and forcefully got a, turned a lot of heads of a, a lot of our star players. But an incredible piece of uh, TV, just uh, just. In ca- like Henry has a line in it you aren't a football fan if you don't like this Barcelona team and it sums it up perfectly yeah, unless you like Real Madrid and like yeah but I think even you have to stri- strip it back if it's just raw football raw emotion yeah. it was beautiful great ac- access to the players um, very well put together and yeah I have to give that a, a mention on the show yeah and I think it's also slightly based on Graham Hunter's the making or Barca the making of the greatest team in the it world is, which yeah. is one of the books I would have read a few years ago really really good again speaks to most of the players so um, yeah Heavily recommended. I haven't actually seen so the documentary. Yeah, no, well but, yeah. The uh, Bobby Robson one that oh, came out yeah, on uh, BBC I, I, I this year. I knew there was, yeah. was one that was in my head that I Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Just a career retrospective. Oh, all but the way unbelievable. Through. Really, really good. It's very, very yeah. well put together. And uh, Rio Ferdinand's uh, documentary earlier, I think it came out in January about his wife. Oh, yes, of and course. It was excellent as well yeah I think Robson's mentioned in that book that's in front of you there anyway Joe the uh, like just how the English press hounded him and then he obviously became a hero and like it's you know, like I mean it's great watching back because you know you do tend to forget that Bobby Robson was a really successful manager with Ipswich and that was and Barcelona and, back and the PS- Barcelona, yeah. PSV as well Newcastle yeah and Newcastle he was fantastic with Newcastle. Newcastle. Newcastle well he was Newcastle. Newcastle's last oh. kind of almost great era like, like so, Newcastle yeah. Champions League yeah I like I, I remember that watching them. It was there was one time at Christmas around two thousand and one or so. They went top of the league at Christmas. They beat Arsenal three one at Highbury. And I remember Shearer and Henri came to almost came to blows on the pitch. Um, but uh, yeah, they beat and like Bobby Ross was in charge. And Newcastle were top for Christmas, and that's not you know you only go back well, you go back seventeen years now. But it was almost like you know everyone looks back on the Kevin Keegan era, but the Bobby Robson era was far more better. Yeah, yeah, it was was just as impressive. Yeah, yeah. there's um, there's a good picture. I don't, I don't know how accurate it is, but it just shows you the Bobby Robson uh, tree of coaches, and it's stacked with people who have course, worked right. underneath him that are now one. fantastic. Yeah, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, Mourinho's one, yeah. uh, Guardiola would have been one, uh, Reichardt, like, he? loads, of, tons and tons of coaches that went on to to do bigger and better things, worked under Bobby Robson in, in his career, so he had, uh, he had a massive impact on football. Steve Staunton didn't really make it out, did he? <laughs> Well, I think yeah, yeah. Ireland, talk, Ireland talk is let's, banned. Let's, let's leave that one there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that sums us up anyway for uh, this year's Christmas special. So, Enda Call, thanks for coming in. Cheers, Ref. Jonathan Higgins. Thank you. Joe Coffey, good Raff. man, making your debut in this studio. Pleasure as always. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this year. Almost, we'll probably do a best of or something for the very, very end of the year, and then we'll be back at some point in January. And uh, uh, undecided. Ma- ma- mail for Sam 2019. Mail for Sam 2019. Leitrim the dry, the dry to win a game up. in 2019. What's hopefully. another year? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to Donegal. Obviously, Enda was chatting to uh, Jim McGuinness there at uh, well a couple of weeks ago. So Jim McGuinness, man, he he can be my winner of the year because he because managed he to go from having no experience in football to landing a head coach role. Exactly. And Jonathan's, of course, the winner as a yeah, Liverpool Galway, fan at the Galway moment. for the double as well. So no. <laughs> Galway for the double. Not all of those things are going to come true. But anyway, uh, best luck to everyone. Anyone who sent in tweets during the year, thanks a million. We'll be back in January. Take it away, Johan. <laughs>